Hi, I'm Mark Tyrrell of Uncommon Knowledge and welcome to four ways to help your client stop worrying. Now, Mark Twain said, drag your thoughts away from your troubles by the ears, by the heels or any way you can manage it. And he was onto something. Of course, worrying and fretting and catastrophizing make people miserable. The word worrying itself comes from the old English expression meaning to strangle. Okay, and people can feel suffocated by their own concerns, you know, being in their head all the time. If you've ever worried, and most of us will uh, fall into chronic worrying to some extent, some of the time, you know how appropriate the origin of the word is. When you can't stop worrying, it really can feel hard to breathe sometimes, you know, when people are worrying at night and it feels overwhelming. And worrying itself can become habitual. You know, I've had people say to me that if they didn't worry, they'd be worried. <laughs> they'd worry about not worrying. So persistent worrying can turn into an uncomfortable habit that's so hard to shake off. You know, chronic worriers even worry when they have nothing to worry about. And that shows us that the worrying itself has just become a way of being, you know, a habit. Some feel that if they stop worrying, then they're tempting fate. I remember one guy I worked with for Fear of Flying uh, told me that he, he almost felt that it was his worrying that kept the aeroplane in the sky rather than, say, jet propulsion, you know. Uh, if he didn't worry, then something bad would happen to the flight, okay. His worrying had some kind of magical power. Worrying, though, isn't harmless. It has consequences. And the more we worry, the more stress hormone we produce and the more we dream at night, okay. And in turn, over-dreaming uh, caused by unresolved worrying can cause clinical depression. So chronic worrying can be quite a bad depressive for people. Um, so helping your clients stop worrying, um, so much at least, can have multiple benefits and mean that they're less likely to get depressed, okay? More likely to get the slow wave type of sleep at night and feel more energized when they've been sleeping. Now, if we look at the role of the imagination, of course, chronic worrying has been called a thought disorder, but it's perhaps more apt to see it as a misuse of the imagination an imagination disorder. And imagination is not just all in your head. It has measurable, palpable effects, both physically and on people's behavior. Another classic misuse of the imagination is, of course, chronic jealousy. Jealous people may imagine all kinds of negative things about their partner's actions and intentions, often with no evidence to back their suspicions up, or perhaps only partial evidence. So again, the, the person's going into the imagination and misusing it to cause them and, the, and other people significant problems. Now, what people worry about, what they imagine, can significantly affect the body, can raise blood pressure. If you imagine something very frightening, then the hypnotic power of that imagination can affect the body um, quite dramatically. Okay, people can sweat, you know, just imagining something that they're scared of. Okay, so that's a profound physiobiological um, or psychobiological uh, effect. So hypnotherapy, of course, only works because the imagination is so powerful. We use the imagination in hypnosis to alter physical phenomena, for example, remove warts or improve immune response or take away pain, and behavioral responses, for example, helping someone stop smoking. So that's what, how we use the imagination constructively. But the common denominator is the imagination and whether a person uses it constructively or destructively, okay? So how do you get your clients to use their imaginations more productively than simply worrying? Okay, so here are four powerful tips. Number one, get distance from the worry. I'll often talk about how we're capable of imagining absolutely anything, but whether we buy into what we imagine or not, is another matter altogether. Stephen King uses his imagination, as do many writers, to create terrifying scenarios, but he produces all these scary ideas from his imagination without being scared witless by these ideas or imaginings himself. 
So he's got some distance on his own imagination. He can clearly separate himself from what he's imagining. Okay, and that's the first step to controlling worrying. Simple as it sounds, this is often a completely new idea for many worriers. As I'm saying this, I can quite vividly imagine the ceiling uh, caving in on top of me. I can imagine that pretty vividly, uh, while not believing for one second that it's going to happen. Okay, that would be an incredible YouTube moment if it actually did happen at the moment, but I don't believe it's going to happen, but I can really imagine it happening. So just because I can imagine it happening doesn't mean it's likely. So rather than trying to get the person not to think about something, which is a useless piece of advice, we can teach our clients to relax deeply whilst imagining what scares them. So we're taking the, the kinesthetic, the feeling effect out of the imagination. They can hypnotically see their worries in the distance over there while feeling very relaxed over here. Okay, so we're giving them some distance on, on, on the workings of their own imagination. Another thing I might do, I, I might even prescribe set doses of worrying time whilst relaxed for the chronically worrying client to do between sessions with me. In effect, we're asking them to worry without feeling worried. And I found this to be surprisingly easy and effective. You know, really emotion is the neon sign yelling, pay attention to this. And when you diminish the emotion, the compulsive thoughts fade away and it becomes much easier for your client to stop worrying. After all, why keep going back to an imagination, an imagined scenario, when there's no particular emotion attached to it? Number two, organize the worry. So there's nothing like a timetable for bringing things under control. You know, worry tends to be intrusive, you know, gate crashing your head when you're trying to think about something else, when you're enjoying yourself or concentrating on something um, outside of the worry, it barges its way in. Prescribing worry time is a neat way of prescribing the symptom and organizing the destructive use of the imagination as a prelude to getting rid of it once and for all. And of course, being able to worry sometimes is useful for all of us. So perhaps we won't, don't want to get rid of it completely, just keep it in its place. Okay. Asking the client to select a specific time of day to sit down and do nothing but worry for a set period, perhaps no longer than 20 minutes, gives them permission to defer worrying. Okay, so worry comes into your head, you think, well, no, I've agreed to do this at three o'clock for 20 minutes and I'll wait till then. When a troublesome thought occurs, then they're to say to themselves, okay, there's, there's a worrying thought there. I'll worry about that during my worry time, but not now. And this soon shows the client that worrying doesn't have the hold over them that they worried it did, that they imagined it did. Okay, you know, we can control worries much more than we assume we can. When they have to do it for 20 minutes, it gets harder and harder to do. You know, it becomes harder to worry. Transforming it's, itself from something that they can't help doing to something that's a real nuisance to keep up, it becomes a chore to worry. Okay, because we prescribed it as, as a chore that you have to do a certain time for a certain set period. Number three, write down solution steps. So worrying that doesn't lead anywhere is like a dog chasing its tail. And, um, you know, it, it leads to a kind of indigestion, emotional indigestion, the pro where the food isn't processed, you know, the emotional fuel isn't processed. It just goes around and around. And it's been shown that writing about emotional issues lowers stress hormone levels, perhaps because writing requires us to use other less emotional parts of the brain, okay, in conjunction with imagining what it is that we worry about. But to be really effective, writing needs to be more than just venting. So get your worry clients to use this practical writing technique. So firstly, we need to get them to list, which means get, getting them to write down exactly and clearly just what they are fearful of, making as full a list as possible. Second, we want them to split, which means mark each item on the list as soluble or insoluble, solvable or insolvable. For example, worries about situations that can't be immediately changed or concerns over the unchangeable past are things that can't be practically solved, only solved in the way that we relate to these things. Next, we have steps. Copy all the solvable items into a single column on one side of the page. Uh, next to each item, write some practical steps that can be taken towards fixing that problem. Next, we have resolve. 
in which we ask them to copy all the unsolvable items into a single column on one of side of another page. And beside each item, describe how they would need to feel differently about these issues in order to resolve these worries psychologically. For example, you know, I need to accept that he's gone and won't be coming back. Okay. And uh, I need to process that emotion and so forth. So there's different ways of solving worries, either emotionally or practically, or both sometimes. Number four, throw your worries away. Writing down bad memories and sealing the paper in an envelope and then throwing it away or putting it away for safekeeping has been found to influence memory in research. A recollection of the emotional details of an event actually becomes weaker after this metaphorical act. Okay, and see reference three in the written article of this. So I once had a client who told me that she was um, worried about certain things she felt she couldn't talk to me about. Okay, and I didn't try to force her to talk to, to me about these things. You know, I respected her, her privacy. And I asked her whether she could write them down so we could dispose of them properly. I wasn't going to read them, but you know, whether she could just write them down, and she did so. I then asked her to take the sealed envelope and put it through my paper shredder. Uh, we then talked about those things she did feel able to discuss with me. Okay, and in a later session, she confided that since doing our ritual, she somehow felt much less concerned about those secret, secret worries that she'd had. Okay, this is a remarkable thing. Uh, almost as if, um, you know, physicalizing them, getting them out of herself, putting them away, shredding them, had had a sort of metaphorically powerful psychological effect. Now, ultimately, worry should be a tool or a signal that lets us know when something might need addressing in our life, you know. So a worry should be something that's an available tool for us, not something that uses us. We shouldn't lose this tool completely, but no tool should ever be allowed to enslave its owner. So I hope you found that useful. And if you did, please hit like and subscribe. And if you want to hear when my next video is published, hit the notification bell below this video. I'm Mark Tyrrell of Uncommon Knowledge. And if you'd like to subscribe to my email newsletter, you can find it over at unk.com slash blog. That's unk.com slash blog. And thanks for watching.